coping mechanisms help you to feel safe in stressful situations or other hostile environments. In short, they help you to cope. But how do we draw the distinction between healthy coping and regressive or repetitive destructive behaviours which arise from unresolved trauma? Because no matter how healed you are, no matter how much you've integrated your unconscious, you're always going to have coping mechanisms. And this is completely normal. It's completely okay. This video is going to help you in that navigation process, however, by giving you a triple layered approach to understanding the difference between repression, suppression, and containment. Because this is truly the way that we can navigate the spectrum of coping in an often very unwelcoming world, which is exactly the sentiment of the person who asked today's inner work question, which I'll bring up for you right now. Second question in the series from Averting Apathy. I love the name and it's well worded, interesting questions. So let's bring it up. Averting Apathy says, I'm convinced that survival in today's world requires dissociation as one of the less harmful coping mechanisms, at least in the short run. A balance between suppression and embodiment and integration. It's kind of rough seeing how this is a sum somewhat common response to the changing environment and world. Would be interesting to hear where you draw the line between healthy coping and pathology. Thank you for the question. Let's try and draw that line, shall we? I've got three story examples that I thought would make this kind of fun and kind of like a choose your own coping mechanism game. We're going to do the environment of the toxic office, we're going to do the unwanted wedding, and we're going to do the traumatic flashback bedroom encounter. Three very different stories where we're going to have characters, it could be yourself if you want to enter into the scene, who have different coping strategies depending upon what's happening. But before we go into those three stories, I want to give some very brief theory. The difference between repression, suppression, and containment. When you're in the trauma healing space, you hear a lot about emotional repression. Typically speaking, this is when the rejected material gets stored down, frozen down, or otherwise pushed into the unconscious mind and the unconscious body. Suppression is somewhere in between repression and emotional containment, because if repression is fully unconscious, this is the trauma being lapsed all the way out of our awareness, the sphere of our awareness, it's all the way over here, and it's only when we have a shadow attack or a shadow swing towards a compulsive behavior, maybe we've drunk too much, maybe we get incredibly angry, that suddenly it comes back in and we act out. Containment is when we do this in a healthy, time-limited way, but let's get to suppression first, because that's the middle ground. The distinction for a coping mechanism being healed is not necessarily never doing the behavior itself. At the root of trauma work is the unpacking, the unburdening, the unfreezing of the root cause. But there comes a moment as we progress on our journey where we go from repression to suppression. And if this is all you get from this video, then I've done my job, because the difference between repressing and suppressing is the degree of awareness that you have that it still remains conscious. This is the difference between the person who is repressing his tendency to, let's say, go out and get drunk every single night, and somehow just doesn't have it in his awareness that it's even a problem. He has all the stories, all the narratives, all the games that he's playing, and it's just out of his awareness. Suppression is that opening of the curtain, that peeking in of awareness where you know that you've got a problem, and the suppression stage is when any genuine recovery movement actually begins. If something is truly repressed, you cannot see it. It's so compacted into the darkness that you have no ability to access it. Suppression is where we tend to work as we start to heal forwards because there's a degree of consciousness. But the aim is containment, emotional containment. And that's the same as suppression, a somewhat conscious awareness with the issue of intention and integrity being added to create something like an action plan. Let's give a few examples in a moment, actually. I'm going to give a few examples after just this one little bit of theory. It's about intention, integration, 
integrity, and crucially, time-limited or time-restricted awareness followed through via action. The difference between suppression and containment in a single sentence is you have noticed what's wrong, you have noticed the behavior, and you say in the back of your mind, you know what, I'm going to address this next weekend with my therapist, or I'm going to make a plan that tomorrow I completely stop this behavior at least for 30 days. That's emotional containment. It doesn't mean that you stopped the acting out process necessarily that time, but you made the choice and you follow it through. This is going to become even more obvious as we go into the three examples. Let's begin with the toxic office environment. Averting apathy, the person who asked the question said, is it necessary basically to be dissociated to some degree in the world that we live in? I would argue yes, because dissociation isn't just a toxic trait which can only function as a defensive response to trauma. It can actually keep you safe. It can help you to cope with the stresses of the everyday life. So in the toxic workplace, let's imagine that you took on a new job and initially you had all the hopes and all the excitements for what your future could bring. Three months in, your colleagues are abusive, your boss is hitting on you, the work itself is unfulfilling, and you know that this is not working anymore. Where do we draw the distinctions between repressive, suppressive, and containment. The repressive behavior is, this is shit, I'm going to complain, and then some other symptomatic burst of behavior will come to cover up the angst that you feel inside. This is the person who does the nine to five in the place that he or she hates, and then every night will go to drinking or go to, you know, kicking the dog, or whatever. I don't need to go into all the examples. They've repressed the core awareness so deeply that they can't even see that the workplace is the problem. Suppression in the toxic environment is you're sat down at your desk and the boss comes by and he gives once more another inappropriate remark about something that you're wearing and you go, hmm, this isn't working and yet I do actually need to stay in this job because I haven't got enough money so I'm just going to literally like dig my fingernails into my hand or I'm going to go into the toilet and cry or I'm going to find some way to stay at this job and just let the steam off. That's suppression. Emotional containment with the intention of action as it lines up with your new integrity is having that same moment where the boss walks by, the boss makes the comment and you go, hmm, yes, sure, ha ha ha. And they leave, but in your mind, you start making your exit plan. It might take two months of savings, it might even take six months of savings. I'm not being completely optimistic to think that you can suddenly leave a job and that might not even be the best choice. But you are completely aware in that moment that something needs to change and you contain the emotion or you don't fully dissociate in the way that you would if you were oppressive and just pretend it's all fine. You don't repress in the same way that you're suppressive, the language gets a bit tricky, and kind of bite your fingers into your hands and do all these weird things, you remain centered and you bring forwards a plan to make your future better. Example number two, the unwanted wedding. This happens to everyone at some point or another, usually in a single year. We're going to go with the wedding example. A family member who you don't necessarily get along with is having a wedding and you are invited to go to this event and let's say for the sake of the story it's going to require you to go away for at least 48 hours there's hotel stays you've got to spend some money you're going to the occasion and there's that feeling that i really don't want to do this but it is family and i will do this because that's what family does but the, the situation actually gets more complex is someone who's recently been honoring their sobriety. You're a couple months into their sobriety. You don't necessarily have all the footing that you would like to have, but you've got the strong private intention that I will not drink at this function. You've recognized the pattern in the past of the creepy uncle and you can deal with him if you've had a few shots of vodka or the annoying cousin and you can likewise deal with her if you're a little bit drunk and tipsy and forget the whole occasion, but you no longer want to repeat the pattern because you want to treat yourself better with reverence, respect, and compassion all lined together. So what happens when you're at the wedding? 
well, there's a choice of not actually going to the wedding at all, and that's called having a healthy boundary and realizing that a family obligation does not mean that you have to do something against your best interests. Nuanced topic, but you never need to do anything. Let's say you go to the wedding, you dress up, you spend the money, you're there. Repressive response, you dissociate so heavily that you just leave your body and you are barely even in the venue. And then a week later, you're still recovering, you're still trying to come back into your body. At worst, maybe you actually even start acting out, maybe you go and pick up the drink, the alcohol, the smell triggers you, you go to the drink and there you go. Three months of progress. Uh, you had a relapse, which is okay, it's part of the process, but there was a different opportunity. The suppression moment, the coping mechanism of suppression. You get offered the vodka martini, and it's from that same creepy uncle, and he's really insistent, and you say, no, no thank you, I'm not drinking, and they go on, go on, it's all fine, it's, it's, your, it's her wedding, and, it's blah, blah, blah. and you're like, this is where it gets difficult. Externally, you might keep on the face and like, no thank you, you're just sipping on your sparkling water, and you're like, mm, no thank you, I'm, you know, I'm doing it for fitness, or whatever it might be. The challenge is the internal narrative. You might be sipping on your sparkling water externally and smiling to the world, but internally you are fighting a war of judgments externally and a lot of internal grounding to keep yourself from falling into the old pattern. You might be saying things like, I can't fucking believe that everyone's doing this, and all of those righteous beliefs that tend to come up in the first few months of sobriety because you're trying to change your narrative, you will project it outwards and need to make the world Normally speaking, some people don't have to go through this stage. Most people have a feeling of wanting to extend their bubble so that alcohol does not enter. And that feeling of your uncle coming in, you might be able to politely say no thank you. Internally, you're saying fuck off, you disgusting man. That's the initial sobriety stage, that's a suppression. And you are burning yourself up on the inside. And again, you may have a response where you go back to the hotel room in the evening and you're punching the pillow, you are sobbing. It was so incredibly stressful. But externally, no one would know. You just got through it, and it's like, wow, it's done. And then you go to the whatever the next day, and then it's over. The emotional containment is to get to a point where the coping mechanism itself is to remain a little bit dissociated, to have a little less sensitivity. This is something that I covered in the highly sensitive person videos that I've done on this channel, which is to show up with a bit of solidity and not need to be emotionally, empathically attuned to everything that's happening in the environment. The drunk uncle comes up, he stinks, he reeks, he's literally putting it into your chest, he's spilling it on you. And you have the compassion in your heart and the centeredness in your heart that you know, I'm not fully here, because if I was fully here, this would be pretty painful, I don't like this, I've chosen to be here and I'm going to stay here. You still give the same external response of no thank you, sip on your sparkling water, but the difference between suppression and emotional containment is you don't have that internal battle. You don't need anything to change because you've already changed, which is a really cliche thing to say, but the difference is distinct. Third example, and this is the most triggering one, and it will be talking about themes of abuse. We're talking about the flashback experience in the bedroom. This is the moment where you're with your partner, and because of something that happened back in your teenage years, a certain physical touch comes through, maybe it's a certain hand on your shoulder like this, or a certain moment during penetration, man or woman, both men and women can experience this. And suddenly, you're out of your body. The sexual trauma has completely clicked on, and your feeling is like, wow, I've been with this person for months, if not years, and I really love them, I really want to be here with them, and you're already having the conscious conversations about healing this pattern, and yet it still just happened again. You're there in that moment with your lover, and you're still dissociating, and you can feel that your heart is hardening, and you are leaving your body. What do we do about this moment? The repressive tendency is to slip back into the old pattern, and watch yourself from third person, or completely do the ridiculous thing of thinking about something unrelated. I think that one of the worst, this is actually a rant on the side, there's dating advice out there for men that they can last longer in bed by thinking about their dead dog or some mundane tax issue. 
I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? You're completely missing the point of being intimate, sure. Maybe you ejaculate in three minutes, but that's not the point. Why would you do that? It just, that's so, so many layers on top of trauma that I can't even unpack it within 20 minutes. Don't do that. But if you are doing that, clearly you're repressing something. And if you're the woman who's likewise leaving her body, and you're maybe in the position where you're just really hyper bodily conscious and you're trying to see yourself as like a, what, where would I look sexy? How would I look good? And is he liking it? That's a repressive coping mechanism. Suppressive is maybe somewhere in between, and it's maybe actually starting to have the conversation or at least doing something that you know will create safety in that moment. I'm not going to go too deep into the examples. That seems like something that would be a whole video in itself. Emotional containment is having the compassion in your heart to realize that you're still healing and there may be a dissociated moment where you're leaving and you're not really there with your lover's eyes and you're not really there with their touch. And you breathe. And maybe if you've got a really loving partner, you say, hey, it's happening again. I really love you. Can we slow down and cuddle? That is a three-second version of the internal awareness as externalized into an intentional, integrity-based action which should restore the connection. And in most cases, if someone's having a trauma-based flashback, if you've got an, an attuned, conscious partner, of course they're going to listen to you. Of course they're going to stop. Of course it's going to change the pace. And a truly intimate moment is maybe the sex stops and you have a three-hour conversation and you cry and you rage and you work through something. And if you have a partner who's worth their time, worth your time, they'll do that with you. Of course, you both probably have need to have several months, if not several years of trauma work to be able to hold that space together. The point is emotional containment looks very different there from emotional repression, but the feeling at the beginning of the dissociative moment still happened. The consciousness and the pre established nervous system work that you've already done is what allows for a different opportunity. In the case of the toxic workplace, the unwanted wedding and the emotion emotional flashbacks in the bedroom, dissociation happens because it's an automatic defense and you have a variety of symptomatic cover-ups. If this is dissociation, that's your core defense and you have a cover-up of whatever form, maybe multiple cover-ups, this ball of trauma that's layered in so many distortions. The consciousness and the inner work peels away those layers to be able to be in the middle, right in the center of that defensive response and choose differently to potentially even dissolve it in the moment. But we're not aiming for complete control. This is the final point that I want to emphasize. How do you dissolve your defenses? You dissolve them over many years and you dissolve them with an everyday awareness that if you have a certain defensive pattern, like dissociation, that has at least a decade, if not multiple decades, of being your default response to strength to stress, not your default response to strength, that comes later. It's going to take many years. It will take consistent embodiment in a reality that you enjoy, which means having a healthy, vibrant, beautiful body that you love being a part of. That's why I recommend fitness so much on this channel. That's why I recommend sobriety. Because it proves that you are honoring your body. You're more likely to have the dissociative experience, not only because of the outer world that you find unpalatable, but if your inner world feels unpalatable. And if you've yet to reclaim the sovereignty of your flesh and extend your ego in the healthiest meaning of that word, your strong ego, to both mind, heart, and body, and eventually your soul, Spiritual ego, that's a whole new topic. Bring it all together, integrate it down, and have the compassion that you will always need coping mechanisms. And for some people, this will be one thing, and for someone else, it will be many other things. For example, for myself, I have a coping mechanism where when I'm stressed, let's say before a client call or before a video shoot, it doesn't need to get too high, maybe like a 3 out of 10 kind of stress level. My coping mechanism is to go for at least a 20 minute walk in nature. Is that toxic? Maybe in a different time, my coping mechanism when I'm way too stressed is to take a half an hour nap. Is that hurting me? Clearly not. There is an end of that spectrum, which is healthy coping. 
There's a lot over here which is clearly unhealthy and clearly dysfunctional, but the adult truth is that you will be the decider. There are general traits which we know are bad for us. The excess of drinking and drugging and abusing your partner, it's clearly bad. But you get to decide where your threshold is, and it's the difference between suppression and containment with a time-limited intention to really work through the pain, to really put on the gauze and bandage up your wounding when you have the time and the presence and the focus. Because a realistic assessment is that many times you'll be in the world and you'll be triggered or you'll be stressed or something will hit you and you do not have the emotional availability to completely unpack it or more often than not, the person who you might be relating to likewise does not have the capacity so you will just sink down to a low level of consciousness and trauma dump or toxic spiral around each other. True emotional containment, healthy coping, is recognizing the power that you have to heal the old patterns and setting aside the time, the space, and lowering your energy to properly work through those issues with the many beautiful books that I recommend on this channel, or maybe a professional therapeutic support if that's the direction that you want to go down. But you can do it yourself, by and large, with consciousness and with awareness when you've tapped into the strength of the heart, clarity of the mind, intuition and intellect wedded together. You can find your own healthy coping mechanisms and maybe there's someone out there who's watching this saying that, man, you're always going for these addicted nature walks. I can't believe it. I can't believe that this guy who I've been listening to, he's addicted to nature and he's addicted to his nap time. Maybe. That's your choice. For me, it seems to work. I know where my thresholds are and I try and stay in that green zone. It's up to you to decide what your green zone might be, but at the very least, it's going to require real vulnerability, which is actually the topic of the next video. We're talking about when to share and when to keep silent. I'll see you over there.